Hey Warriors, let's talk disulfiram today. Um, it has been quietly making its way through the Lyme community over the last few years with a few clinicians prescribing it. And then it, it's been gaining traction and recently Lyme disease, Lyme disease.org, excuse me, published an article about a physician prescribing it and using it and the results that he's seeing in his clinic with his patients. So it sort of has really kind of taken it through the um, mainstream Lyme media and pushed it to this tipping point. And when I was at the Live Lyme Summit, uh, Dr. Rajadas, who is the researcher out of Stanford who discovered the application of disulfiram and Lyme disease, gave a talk about it and went into great length about his research and he's just seriously one of the most genuine, kind, excited doctors slash researchers that I have come across in a really long time. And he was so great about answering everyone's questions. And um, he, shockingly was really supportive of the clinical world using the drug um, and uh, just being very careful with it and cautious with their patients but it's not often that you have the research world you know supporting the clinical world when the research world's work isn't done yet you know they're usually like well the findings you need to wait for the findings and Dr. Rajadas was just like, for all of you clinicians in the audience, I, I support you in using this medication in an off-label manner. Just please, you know, take diligent notes, go very low, very slow. And so that's the mantra, as with all things Lyme-related in treatments, low and slow. So let's kind of talk about disulfiram and sort of the highlights. One of the huge things is that it crosses the blood-brain barrier, which is enormous for everyone with neurological Lyme. And it doesn't affect the microbiome like all the other antibiotic protocols. Um, it keeps the microbiome intact. And as we all learn about the importance of the microbiome and our immune system, you know, this is a huge selling point for disulfiram. Um, the, the main drawback, the drawback is uh, the alcohol component. And so for those of you who are unaware about the history of disulfiram, it's actually, it's other name is antabuse. And it has been historically prescribed for people who suffer with alcoholism. And what it does is it creates this insane reaction in your body to alcohol, like the worst hangover you could ever imagine. And Dr. Rajadis was very, very clear and said over and over and over again, that for those of us who suffer with chronic Lyme disease, the reaction is a thousand times of what someone who suffers with alcoholism would, would be. Meaning that the smallest amount of alcohol in your system, whether you ingest it um, or put it topically on your skin, that it will, what were his words, it will make you cry it will make you go to the ER and it will make you feel that you are walking through hell. Those were his words. So he was very adamant that you have to look at your cleaning products. You have to look at your laundry detergent. You have to look at hair products, makeup, lotion, um, anything that you would put on topically as well as drinking alcohol. But we also need to keep in mind that alcohol it comes in other forms other than, you know, beer, wine, blah, blah, blah. Like we're talking about kombucha. We're talking about soy sauce. Any food that's fermented literally gets broken down in your gut into alcohol. So, you know, I'm, I read in these groups, like someone's like, oh God, I had a little bit of kombucha and I came, you know, this close to going to the ER. You have to make sure that you study what gets broken down as alcohol, um, and, and really understand what you're putting in and on your body. Otherwise, it's, I heard it's just the worst kind of pain that you could ever imagine. And so those were the, the huge components. And then as I'm in these groups and I'm reading, because I'm always trying to learn, is that um, 
when you first start taking the disulfiram, that the exhaustion component is so profound. And so as I'm reading through PubMed and reading all these different um, papers that have been published, the disulfiram actually increases the brain's um, the brain levels of tryptophan. And so that's literally what causes this enormous amount of fatigue that everybody is feeling. And so low and slow, and I mean like everyone is starting out at about 62 and a half milligrams and they're pulsing it every other day. And what I'm also seeing across the board is that everyone who takes this has that profound exhaustion right away. So you are, it is low and slow. It is pulsed. Um, you know, you're working up to the working or maintenance dosage of 500 milligrams. It's a relatively short course of treatment, anywhere from four to six months. Uh, um, <clears throat> there was one other drug that uh, Dr. Rajatis talked about, and I'm gonna show you a slide from the conference, and it's a terrible photo, so I apologize right now, but I want you guys to look at this um, slide that he showed. Okay, so you guys can see that the antibiotics are listed on the left and that the next column is the basis of selection, the nature of the antibiotic, the in vitro, the in vivo, and then whether or not it works on the persister cell. And this is the key part for everyone with chronic Lyme is the, the persister cell. So you'll see that there's two medications that are listed, azlocillin, which is an antibiotic, and the disulfiram. So let's talk about the azlocillin. It's been researched, it's been looked at, it's been written about, you know, in PubMed and NIH, and it has zero side effects to it. It actually gets at the persister cell. It does affect the microbiome because it is an antibiotic. And I know that there's a researcher in Japan right now who's working on a study looking at it, and Dr. Rajatis referenced him, and I'm sorry, you guys, I, I wasn't able to get the name down, and. And so I can't share that with you. But for those who, and, and, and again, doc, Dr. Hello, Dr. Rajatis was like, for those of you who are not ready to go the disulfiram route, the azlocillin is another option. And that for clinicians who are hesitant to prescribe the disulfiram, that you can actually make a case for the azlocillin and, and to do that. Um, the other thing that he talked about that I was really, it, it caught me by, I don't know, by surprise, uh, pleasantly, is that he kept talking about support groups on Facebook. And there's two. There's the disulfiram for Lyme support group, and then there's the disulfiram for Lyme group. And he is a member of both. I know Liegner is a member of one and actually participates and answers questions, which is crazy, right? But Dr. Rajatis referred to the disulfiram for Lyme group several times and one of the administrators, her name is Christina, and he said that he pours over everyone's um, comments and the anecdotal data that he's gathering from it has been really helpful and that the, the amount of information and the sharing in these groups is so profound that he, he literally was like, if you are considering taking disulfiram if you are in it if or starting it in it or have finished that please participate share support one another um, he equated the discovery of disulfiram for Lyme to the discovery of aspirin for the cardiovascular and everything else that aspirin basically works for. I mean, it's insane. And he really thinks that when he's done with his clinical studies and findings that it's it, disulfiram really is going to be like aspirin is, you know, that the breadth and depth of the application of this drug is, is going to be gigantic. And he's really excited about the possibilities and he's he's loving reading everybody's stories and 
how they're getting better. And so as science moves forward and takes it, our disease process seriously, you know, this is, these are great, great strides for everybody. And the other thing, and I can't believe I almost forgot this, is he kept talking about the inflammation, inflammation in Lyme, inflammation, inflammation. And we all know, for those of us who are either in remission or, you know, the cure word, um, inflammation is still a factor. It's still a factor for me. I mean, I have MCAS. I'm, you know, doing gut work, working on my mast cell activation. And he said, he kept talking about the, the, the inflammation component in relation to disulfiram. And so I wanted to make sure that I understood him. So after his, his t presentation, I went and I asked him specifically and I said, all right, so you talk about the inflammatory response and the activation of MCAS because of this inflammation cycle that we go through. And you talk about the role of disulfiram in, in inflammation. I said, so is it possible to extrapolate that if someone has mast cell activation due to chronic Lyme disease, that taking disulfiram will actually inhibit the inflammatory process and put the mast cell activation away. Like put it in check, put the body into a more homeostasis state. And he was like, absolutely. Which I was like, oh. So, kind of begs the question of if you did another therapy, whether it be antibiotic, hyperthermia, herbal, and you're in remission, but you still are dealing with a chronic inflammation in and in an MCAS situation, would the addition of disulfiram help that? I don't know, but it's a good question to ask your doctor. Okay, you guys? So I just wanna tell you from the rainy state of Colorado, Love and light, health and wellness always, and two more steps. Happy fall. I wish you guys a great season. Talk to you soon.